Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy little human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this craziness today, you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the disappearance of Kristen Smart. Because if you have been paying attention, and I imagine if you're into the true crime, you have been watching the news, but after almost 25 years, there has finally been an arrest in the missing persons case of Kristen Smart. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell because I put out a new morbid makeup video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. So do that and join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. And if you want, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. They're both Brat or seen just like my namesake here, but you know, no pressure. And now that we're done with that pesky but totally necessary self-promotion, we can get into this case. And this case, man, has been popping off and it has been all consuming to me for the last three days. Ever since the, the um, alert of the arrest came out, the news media started talking about it. I was just like every single article I was reading, every couple hours I would search her name again just to see updates. The man who was arrested, so there were two men arrested. One of them is Paul Flores. One of them is his father, Ruben Flores. And Paul Flores was the police's number one suspect for the longest time, like right from the beginning. He was the last person to be seen with her. He, you know, there's just like a lot. And it seemed very obvious that this man was involved way back when, but for some reason it took 25 years for them to get an arrest. And I'm very, very curious about what's gonna happen, but you know what? Let me just get into telling you the story because there is a lot to it. I'm going to cover the whole disappearance. I'm going to cover the arrests. I'm going to cover the theories and what they think happened to 19 year old Kristen Smart. So come gather around and let me tell you the story of the disappearance of Kristen Smart. Kristen Smart was born in Augsburg, Germany on February 20th, 1977, making her a Pisces. She was the eldest of three children born to parents, Stan and Denise Smart, who were both teachers. Stan and Denise were so, so happy to find out that they were pregnant with Kristen. They had initially believed that they could not conceive and had even considered adopting a baby, but their prayers ended up being answered when after two days of labor, Kristen was born. Kristen and her family moved to America when she was just a tiny baby and the three of them settled in Stockton, California. Kristen was a fast learning baby. She learned to walk and talk particularly early and seemed to have a total sense of invincibility, except of course for her allergy to milk. In October of 1979, Stan, Denise, and Kristen welcomed another member of their family into the world, a baby boy that they named Matt. They probably named him Matthew, but he was he's called Matt in all of the articles. And Kristen was so stoked to be a big sister. She loved her little brother. She always wanted to play with him. She was like, when is he going to walk? She wanted him to grow up and be big enough to play with her immediately and showed very little to no resentment at no longer being the only child. In January of 1982, the family welcomed their last baby into the world, a little girl that they named Lindsay. So now Kristen had a tiny baby sister to play with, somebody to grow up with, somebody to mold, and for her to be a role model for. And Kristen and Lindsay grew up very close. She was just like a good big sister. Kristen grew up a strong girl, an athletic girl, a swimmer. Her family described her as a dreamer and as a girl who would give you bear hugs and she would sit in her father's lap even as a teenager when most teenage girls were no longer interested in being good friends with their fathers. She would cook her family omelets in the morning and she loved the ocean and poetry and traveling and volleyball and water skiing. She was even a camp counselor in Hawaii after graduating from high school and had traveled to London and to Venezuela as a foreign exchange student. She played soccer and did competitive swimming, and she would ride her bike to work at her part-time job as a lifeguard. She was the type of girl who was the most trusted babysitter in the area. All the parents would opt for Kristen first if they had that choice because Kristen was just really good with their kids, really engaging, played with them, did activities with them, didn't just put them in front of the TV. And I guess playing on the phone wouldn't be the thing in the 90s, but she, she was very interactive and engaging with their kids, so they always wanted her first. To her friends, she was a warm person, a happy person, the last person you would ever think that would be confrontational. Anybody, she would never be the one to start a fight and she loved having people over for sleepovers. She had a bright smile and a loud laugh. She loved Bob Marley and Tom Petty and she was sweet and shy but timid. She was very mellow but very approachable and you could tell her whatever you wanted and she'd listen and do whatever she could to make you feel better. 
She was very close with her family and would always call home. And this is something that she carried with her throughout her life, even into her college years. She called home to speak to her family every Sunday because they were incredibly close. And that's going to be noteworthy later because she would call every Sunday without fail. When Kristen was 19 years old, she enrolled in college at California Polytech State University, which just goes by Cal Poly, which is how I'm going to refer to it later. That's what everybody calls it. Um, and she went there after graduating from Lincoln High School. Initially, she had planned to go to a different school, but after thinking it over and talking with her parents, they decided that she should go to a school that's a little bit closer to home. So she went to Cal Poly. And she was studying and majoring in communication studies with a plan of traveling the world as a reporter once she graduated. People who knew Kristen during her time in school described her during this time as very happy, very friendly, a little bit timid, but when she started, you know, drinking at the college parties, she became the type of person who would talk to anyone. She was also known as being very engaged in her studies. She was always studying, always trying to make sure to be getting good grades, and she was having a lot of trouble actually during her first year at Cal Poly. And she even had a breakdown close to the time that she, she ended up disappearing where she told her mother that she wanted to leave the school. She wanted to drop out of Cal Poly and try enrolling somewhere else because she was having so much trouble keeping up with her workload and she thought maybe she'd have a better chance going to a different school to get her degree. But her mom told her like, listen, this is how it goes. Your first year of college is gonna be hard. There is an adjustment period. You are strong, you are capable, and you can work this out. Kristen was finding herself in college. She was trying to, you know, figure out who she was as a person and become the adult she was going to be. She started going by nicknames. People called her Roxy, which was interesting because she actually had a friend named Roxy growing up. So I'm not sure if maybe that's where she got that name. It's a cute little nickname. And she was just like a good time girl. She was going to parties and she was the type of person who always just had to have fun. Even if she was not drunk at these parties, she'd pretend to be drunk just to have a little more fun with the situation. Kristen Smart went missing on the Friday of Memorial Day weekend, May 25th, 1996, from the Cal Polytech University campus when she was 19 years old. She was just finishing up her freshman year. She was about six feet tall with straight blonde hair. She was very pretty and had a total beach girl vibe look to her. At the time of her disappearance, she lived on campus at Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo, California. The night that Kristen disappeared, she had gone out on the town looking for something fun to do with a couple of other girls from her school. Her best friend at the time did not want to go out. She was, she had stuff to do. She had to study. She wasn't looking for that kind of night, but Kristen was very persistent. So they ended up going out. And while they were leaving, they ran into two other girls who lived in the same area who also wanted to go out. So the four of them started mobbing out together. They got in one of the other two girls' cars and started driving around. And eventually they found one party where they went and after a little bit of time there, they were like, this isn't very fun. So they left and they started driving around and eventually they split off from the other two girls and it was just Kristen and her good friend. I believe her name was Margarita. The two started walking around the streets trying to find something to do. Kristen was like really dedicated to finding a party that night. It was what she wanted to do, but since it was Memorial Day weekend, a lot of people had left for the weekend, had gone home, had gone on trips. So they were having a little trouble finding something to do. And Margarita was like, you know what? This is, I'm done. We've been doing this forever. I didn't even want to go out. I got to pee. I don't want to go. And Kristen was like, please, you know, come with me. Let's just go a little farther. And Margarita's like, nah, brah, I am done. So the two said their goodbyes. Margarita gave Kristen the keys to get back into their, their building. And the two parted ways. And this is a point that obviously now Margarita feels bad about. But at the time, she was just like, bro, I don't want to go party. I just want to go and study and go to sleep. The party that Kristen ended up finding that night, because she did find a party, was just like a typical college party for one of the friend's birthdays. There were a lot of people there, there was a keg, there was loud music, and people did remember seeing her that night because they said that she seemed kind of like she was on something, but not a downer. She was very hyper and energetic and flirtatious. And one guy, I think his name was Trevor, had spoken um, of his accounts of that night and said that he did not know her, but at one point she just like walked right up to him, introduced herself and started kissing him. The guy said that she then actually grabbed his arm and pulled him into the bathroom. And he thought at the time that he was probably gonna get lucky because she was like really hot, obviously. A lot of people found her very attractive. She was remembered that night for being like the hot girl there. But when they got inside the bathroom, she just started looking at herself in the mirror and asking over and over if he thought she was ugly, which makes people think that maybe again, she was on something. She was also reported to have been heavily drinking, which according to her friends and family, wasn't incredibly common of her. 
But it was, there was different reports at the party of what actually happened. Some people said they saw her drinking a lot. They saw her drinking tequila and vodka. And some people said they never saw her with a drink in her hand at all. So some people had suspected that maybe she had been drugged. At about 2 a.m. the night of the party, an, a fellow student who had been at the party, a man named Tim Davis, came upon Kristen passed out in somebody else's yard. She was just like laying in the grass and he was like, okay, girl, you gotta go. And he tried to wake her up to tell her to leave. And she was really heavily intoxicated and just started talking about being cold. So he started to try to help her up out of the grass. And this is when another student, a girl named Cheryl Anderson came upon the two and offered to help as well. So the two of them lifted her up, figured out where she lived and started heading her back to her dorm room which is like the thing to do. You don't just leave a drunk girl alone passed out in the grass. They were like, let's help her get home safe, which is the right thing to do. So while the two were walking Kristen back to her room, they ran into another man, a man named Paul Flores, who Tim Davis describes as showing up out of nowhere. And he was like, what's going on guys? What's up with this girl? And they explained what was going on. And he's like, oh man, I will definitely also help you guys escort her home. We, I'm a good guy, right? So we're going to do this together. We're all in this together. And he put an arm around her waist and started helping walk her home as well. So at this point, for whatever reason, the group starts to break apart. So Tim Davis was the first one to leave. And this is because he lived off campus and his car was in the total opposite direction. So he's like, okay, there's two of you. I'm going to head back to my truck and head home. So he did that. So now it's just Cheryl, Paul and Kristen. And every so often while they were walking along, Kristen would just stop walking because she was pretty heavily intoxicated and she would just, you know, get sick, have to stop. And every time she did this, Paul would tell Cheryl like, oh, go ahead. I got her. If you don't want to wait, not a big deal. You go about your business. And Cheryl was like, this is kind of weird. So she did not go about her business and she chose to stay with the duo. That was until the three of them hit Cheryl's dorm room though. When they got to Cheryl's dorm, which was way before Kristen's dorm, which was further down, Cheryl made the decision to leave Kristen with Paul because Paul's dorm room was right by Kristen's. And she asked him like, hey, are you sure that you will, you're will? you good to take her and get her all the way into her room? I wanna make sure she's okay. If you can't do it, I will. And he's like, don't worry, I got it. It's on my way. You go ahead and go home, no big deal. And she was like, okay. But then, okay, Paul was like, before you leave, can I like have a good night kiss? And she was like, no, who even are you? You weirdo, absolutely not. And then he's like, well, can I have a hug then? And she's like, no, I, I don't think I'm gonna do that. And after that weird exchange, Cheryl went inside, leaving Kristen alone with Paul to walk her the rest of the way to her door. And Paul's account of the night is that he did just that, that the two walked all the way to the entrance of her dorm building. And once they got there, oh, by the way, on the way there, he says that she was so drunk that he had to hold her up the entire time. But by the time they had gotten to her room, she was okay enough that he could leave her at the door, like near the, the pathway up to her building. And then he watched her walk inside the building, did not escort her to her room. And then he went off to his room that was in the opposite direction. And that that's the last time he ever saw her. And that account from Paul was the last time that Kristen was ever seen alive. She was last seen wearing a cropped gray t-shirt, black like shiny athletic shorts, and red Puma shoes. So Kristen had called her parents and left a voicemail at their home the Friday that she disappeared. And her family says that she sounded really happy on this voicemail. She told them that she had some good news, that she would call back at their usual day on Sunday to discuss this news. At the time, her parents didn't know what the news was. They later found out that she had, it was something about a grade. So she was really excited that she was going to get to make up like for a test that had been lost that uh, she initially had like a zero on. And she was super stoked because her teacher was going to let her make it up. But that's not really important. I just thought that you might want to know what her last voicemail ended up being about. But anyway, so her parents were like, okay, cool. She sounds happy. That's great. And then Sunday came and she never called. And by Monday, she still hadn't called. And this is when her parents were like, well, that's weird. That's very much not like her. And when they couldn't get a hold of her, they started calling all her friends. And that's when they found out that nobody had seen her in days. So then they freak out and they call campus security. Campus security did not take Kristen's disappearance very seriously at first. They assumed like this is a college girl. It's Memorial Day weekend. She probably went away for the weekend and just didn't tell her parents. And she's not back yet because she's been, you know, partying, having some fun, doing what college kids do. But her parents were like, no, absolutely not. She didn't take any of her stuff with her. 
she would not do this. We're very close, but they were still like, eh, I think maybe she's, she's just having some fun. But it wasn't only Kristen's parents who called concerned about Kristen. Kristen's roommate had also called because she had seen Chris, all of Kristen's items spread out on her bed on Friday after she, like when she had left for the party, she had left some stuff on her bed. And when her roommate saw the next day that the stuff was still there, she's like, oh, she clearly hasn't slept in her bed. So when Saturday rolled around and she still wasn't home, things were all spread out on her bed. She's like, okay, this is really weird. So she called campus security. Campus security blew her off. So she then called the regular police who told her to call campus security. So she called campus police again and they're like, okay, let me, let me look into this. So they call Kristen's parents and they're like, Hey, have you seen your daughter? And they're like, no, we've been trying to find where she is. And it just didn't get taken seriously. Even after getting reports from the roommate and the parents, they still thought that she was just away having fun and didn't report it. In light of this obvious mishandling of Kristen's case, I mean, they realized that, Hey, this was not the per appropriate course of action in this disappearance case. And unfortunately, it's always too little too late. They always have to wait for something to happen to put things in place to keep people safe that should have been done already. But you know what? That just seems to be how it goes. Just like with, it doesn't matter. It does matter. Everything matters. Also nothing at all in life matters. But anyways, due to the slow response to the disappearance of Kristen Smart, the Kristen Smart Campus Security Act was written and passed by California State Legislature and signed into effect in 1998. The law requires that all public colleges and publicly funded educational institutions have to have their security services make agreements with local police departments about reporting cases involving or possibly involving violence against students, including missing students. But you know, this wasn't in effect when Kristen went, went missing, which again, it always takes something bad happening for things to be put into place to keep us safe. The Tylenol murders. Anyways, back to the story. So Kristen's family was like, no, they did not take what campus security was saying and just like sit back and run with it. So they went over campus security's head and they contacted the actual police. But for whatever reason, like nobody was taking this seriously and it took days before an actual police report was filed. And Kristen's family has described the school's response to their da daughter's disappearance as, and I quote, looking for a lost bicycle, which is just so sad. I feel so bad for them. Kristen was just gone, man. She hadn't taken any of her money, any of her items. She didn't have a way to get anywhere. She didn't drive. So it's not like she could really just like go anywhere without any help and without any of her items. And still it wasn't taken seriously, which is just incredibly disappointing because of the missing time is missing evidence. It's missing everything. Those are like the crucial hours that just weren't taken seriously. And now this case wasn't solved for 24 years. So think about that. Once Kristen was reported missing and people started taking it seriously and realizing like this girl is actually gone. Like there's something going on here. People started looking everywhere for her. A lot of these people weren't even law enforcement. They were just concerned citizens who had heard about the case. People were searching on horseback. They were using ground penetrating radar, trying to see if anything had been buried. People searched by helicopter and there were even psychics that showed up and tried to determine where she had been. And of these psychics, there were two of them who had told, Kristen's father that Kristen could be found or something related to Kristen could be found in the hills behind Cal Polytechnic. And so he went in the dead of summer in California and searched those hills by foot, but came back empty handed. And while all of this is happening, her mother's just sitting by the phone waiting for a call to let her know where her daughter was, if she had been found any update on her daughter. Police were also investigating during this time and during their investigations, they were finding that most everything was leading back to one main suspect. Paul Flores. Now, who was Paul Flores? Paul Flores is a man who was born to parents Ruben and Susan Flores. There isn't a ton of information out just yet on his younger years. Maybe with time we will know, but I know for now that his parents were divorced when he was young and that he wasn't a very popular kid growing up. He had a few friends, but it was more like they were just acquaintances. During high school, he had developed several nicknames with his peers, like Creepy Paul and Psycho Paul. Not to his face, of course, but this was the type of kid that people did not really want to hang out with alone, particularly the girls. There were a couple of women who were interviewed about Paul Flores in the podcast called Your Own Backyard, which if you want to learn more about this case, and hear actual firsthand interviews. This is a really, really great podcast about this case. The guy who did it 
went all over personally and interviewed so many people that hadn't been interviewed by police so you can he actually hear their interviews. But the girls who were interviewed said that Paul was super, super weird and that though they never considered him to be violent, when they found out that he was res that he was connected with a missing girl, they immediately were like, oh, he definitely had something to do with it. One girl who had worked with Paul, uh, I believe it was after high school, had told the interviewer, the guy with the podcast, that while they were working together, one day she was driving home and she lived in an area where the, it was like super remote. There was no reason for anyone who was not from that area to be in that area. And she noticed that Paul was following behind her. So she was like, yo, are you doing? That's weird. And he's like, I just wanted to know where you live. That's weird. That's a weird thing to do. In, in that podcast, most of the people interviewed, not just women, just most people in general who were interviewed for that podcast, when they heard that Paul had been the last person to see a girl who ended up disappearing, they were not at all surprised to hear he was involved in something like that, which is like really unsettling. Paul was an extremely average student academically in high school. He didn't even actually have the grades that would normally get a person into Cal Poly, but because he was a local, I guess the school gave special consideration to those who were local to the area. So he got in on like a technicality. He was not, he did not have the grades to get there. Paul wasn't doing much better academically at Cal Poly either. He was not getting very good grades. He was failing both math and English. He had a D in his major class, which was food sciences. And the only class he ended up getting like a good grade in was a pass fail class, which he passed. And that was bowling. And I don't know why that's funny to me, but it's funny to me. During Paul's freshman year, he had a whopping GPA of 0.6. And he actually ended up dropping out of Cal Poly right after Kristen disappeared. I'm just saying. Police also discovered that there was something in his history that was a bit more concerning than his, than his poor academic grades. There had been a previous complaint from a female student who had called police after Paul scaled her like terrace outside, got on her balcony and was peeping at her through her window. She told him to leave and he wouldn't. So they called the police and police had to tell him to get off the property. This is the man who walked a drunk Kristen Smart home alone, completely at his will while she was heavily intoxicated. Okay, and then she disappeared. So that is a tad bit sus, no? Fellow classmates found the 5'10", 170 pound Paul Flores quite annoying. He was the type of guy who would get super drunk at parties and then hit on all the other guys girlfriends. He was even given a nickname by the girls in his school and in his class as Chester the Molester Dude. This guy. This freaking guy. His fellow peers just thought he was a weird, pushy, braggy, virgin loser. He was literally, Paul Flores was literally a virgin who couldn't drive, okay? Even Paul's parents knew that he didn't really have any friends and while he was still living at home, they had bought a pool table to keep in the house to try to like beckon the neighborhood kids to come and hang out with him, which when you hear that, it's a little sad, but don't feel sad for Paul Flores because Paul Flores can literally suck this dick, bro. Anyways, Paul Flores was also at that party that Kristen was at the night that she disappeared. So he wasn't just some random dude on the street who found them. He was somebody who was at that party. And apparently at that party, Kristen and Paul had had at least one interaction with each other, okay? Tim Davis, you remember the guy who had first found her? Well, he said that while at the party, he had been standing there when he heard a really loud noise coming from the hallway area. So he looked into the hallway and saw that Kristen and Paul Flores were both on the ground and he was on top of her. She didn't seem to be freaking out or anything, and he couldn't tell if maybe they had both fallen, slammed into each other, everybody's drinking, or if he had knocked her down, but the two got up, brushed, brushed off the fall, and went their separate ways. With all of that information, police were very interested in Paul. That's one thing. They were like, hmm, we should probably look into this guy. So they start hanging out with him, spending a lot of hours in a lot of days with him, trying to kind of like get his story, make him feel comfortable with them, and chip away at his alibi. So one thing about Paul that seems random at first, but comes into play is that Paul had had issues with drinking and he had actually been pulled over for a DUI more than once. And so he got pulled over for a DUI and he got his license suspended. And then he drove with a suspended license and he ended up getting arrested. And this was right after Kristen disappeared. So they arrested him and they took a mugshot photo. And in this photo, 
he had a black eye and police had not seen this yet, but there's photographic evidence of it. So they know that after she disappeared, he had it. In addition to his black eye, when he was questioned by police, he had scratches on his arms and legs. And when police asked him what happened, he was like, oh, I was playing a game of basketball with my friends and I got beat up. But then police were like, okay, let's go question this friend who's playing basketball with. So they asked the friend like, hey, did this happen? The friend's like, actually, no, he showed up with those and it was super weird. And when I asked him how he got them, he said he didn't remember. Paul. So police went back to Paul and they're like, why are you lying, bro? We know that that's not what happened. He's like, okay, okay. I don't remember what happened, but I didn't want to look guilty. So what really happened is I just woke up with it and I, I have no idea. Okay. So later police decide that they're going to search the school. So they bring in cadaver dogs that are trained to search for the smell of human decomposition. And they start searching the whole campus area near Kristen's dorms. Right. So they're searching and there's four different dogs and they're taking them through one at a time so that there are searches. And if they alert on anything, the dogs won't be like influenced by the other dogs. They wanted to see independent results from each dog. Okay. So all four dogs independently alerted on one room, the room that had previously belonged to Paul Flores. Cause at this time, remember he dropped out of school after Kristen disappeared. The dogs all alerted to his room. Each one, when they were brought over there, started barking and scratching at his door. So police go in with the dogs independently, each dog. So the room had been split into two when Paul lived there. His roommate had one side of the room. He had the other side of the room. All the dogs went to the side of the room where Paul and his items had been. They all hit on Paul's bed. Okay. All of them hit on Paul's bed, but there was no evidence in this room because Paul had already left and the school had cleaned out the room by the time police got there. So police are like, let's interview Paul's old roommate. So they bring the roommate in, they talk to him. They realize this roommate had been away Memorial Day weekend, which means Paul would have had the room to himself. And the roommate also told him something interesting that after Kristen disappeared, he was kind of joking with Paul, like, oh man, did you have anything to do with it? And Paul said, oh yeah, she's back at my house with my mom. Oh, and also an anonymous tip came into police that they believe was from a neighbor that said, that the night that Kristen disappeared, Paul and his family had been at one of their homes and they were digging holes and filling them with concrete. Real casual light. I actually have real quick, a mid mid story, mid video fun fact for you about this case. So while investigating this case, police were actually considering for a short period of time, Scott Peterson, you know, Scott Peterson, Lacey Peterson's husband, Lacey Peterson's murderer. They considered him a suspect because at the time that Kristen disappeared, he was actually a senior at Polytech. Poly, Polytech? Cal Poly. Uh, Cal Poly. They ended up looking into him. They found out it wasn't him. He was completely excluded. But I just found that to be very interesting because this was before he was even arrested for his wife's murder. So interesting, interesting facts. Anyway, back to Paul. So police tell Paul they want him to take a polygraph test and he keeps dodging them. But one day they show up, they pick him up and they're like, Hey, we're going. And he's like, Oh, okay. So they take him there. He's pale as a ghost. The interview lasts about 90 minutes. And during the interview, they're like, so what's up, bro? Why are you lying about your black eye and your scratches? And he's like, okay, what really happened? I, I didn't want to seem like a klutz. I was fixing my car in the night in the driveway of my parents' house. And I accidentally slammed my own face into my own steering wheel. Totally believable. I, Paul is unlucky dude. During Paul's interview, the most notable thing about him was not his answers, but it was his body language. When they started to press him on the fact that he was the last person to see Kristen smart alive, he, okay. So he's sitting in a chair. He like hunched forward. He brought his knees to his chest, making himself into a tiny ball. Okay. He was not playing it cool and police thought he was going to break. They thought he had him or they thought they had him, but he didn't. Instead, he said to the officers in response, and I quote here, if you are so smart, then tell me where the body is. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and after this interview, his mom got him an attorney. So police searched the home of Paul's parents, Ruben and Susan. They, the two were separated. Okay but they only searched one of the homes, if I remember correctly, right? So they're at the home and they're searching it. And they, at this time, they're just looking for any evidence 
that belonged to Kristen, something that could show that he had something of hers. They weren't like digging up the property or anything like that. And while they're searching this house, they find something very interesting. Under Paul's mattress and under his father's mattress, they found articles written about Kristen's disappearance. That is, that's weird. It's a, it's a weird thing to keep under your mattress if you have nothing to do with her disappearance, in my opinion. Let me know what you think, but um, I think that's weird. So Reuben and Susan owned a property that they sometimes used as a rental property. And at one point in time, there was a young couple there living there with their baby. And while living there, the woman of the couple, I believe her name was Mary, she had been in the yard and in the driveway, she found an earring. And it is generally believed that this earring likely belonged to Kristen because there is a photo of Kristen where she's wearing a necklace that according to this woman completely matches the earring that she found. And this was found on a property that at one point Paul's mother had lived in. Apparently when the woman found it, she thought it was important. She put it because it had like a little bit of a red smudge on the back that she thought was odd. So she put it in a Ziploc bag. She gave it to the police, but for whatever reason, this got lost before being put into evidence. So we can't even tell for sure if it belonged to Kristen. And apparently her parents had been asking police to see this earring for like a long time to determine if it was hers and they kept blowing them off. And it's because they lost it and didn't want the parents to know allegedly on another little note while this family was living in this house they received letters and like postcards and stuff all the time that were addressed to the Floreses that said things like you need to admit what you know tell your son to tell the truth so the community was is pretty against this family and they think he has something to do with it which same this couple even ended up appearing in a deposition when okay so later on <laughs> The Smarts ended up suing Paul Flores in a civil case for a wrongful death suit. Sorry, my brain turned off. And this couple actually was was part of the deposition because they lived on the property and they needed to say what they knew, they knew. And the Flores family was pissed about this. So they actually evicted this couple from the home and the couple was like, what the hell? And they started treating them really badly. Like, how dare you kicking them out? So since an eviction process takes a little bit of time, especially in California, and it sounds like they were served with the 30 day notice to quit, the couple was like, you know what? I'm gonna let police search this house because police had asked them and they're like, you know what? Yeah, go for it. Search the house and all and everything, just go. And they let police in to search the house. So when they came to search the house, they used ground penetrating radar and they searched the backyard and they did notice an anomaly under a certain piece of concrete, but it didn't appear like it was a body. So they didn't check further. The man who conducted the interview said like it, he couldn't determine one way or another, but he was pretty sure that it wasn't a body. It also appeared that at some point the ground had been dug up and concrete that had been there had been removed because there was chunks of concrete and there was like a smudge on the side of the house that looked like dirt had been piled up there for a while. Mary, the woman who lived there at the time, the one who was deposed and all that, she believes that Kristen was probably buried on that property at some point and that they dug her up and removed her. This is what is in her gut. Is that true? We don't know, but that's what she believes and that whole yard at least to date, as far as I know, has never been fully, fully searched. <laughs> and the reason that police didn't dig it up sooner is because they weren't confident that it would yield any results and they didn't want to have to pay to repair the property afterwards if they didn't find something. So, okay. So once the couple moved out of the property, the Floreses did not get another tenant. Instead, Susan moved in the house herself, which is like fine. She owns it. But I wonder if that had anything to do with the fact that these people let police search the property and they wanted to make sure that this didn't happen ever again. Just a thought. The yard of this house did end up getting searched again at some point. It, not because the Flores gave permission, but I believe it's because they got a warrant. But this wasn't until 11 years later. Okay. But when they searched the grounds, nothing was found. And it's because in my, well, it's not, okay. Okay. The warrant that they had did not give them access to dig up all of the ground or to have access to the entirety of the property. They could not alter the property in order to search the ground. So they could only search in accessible places. So they weren't able to search below a garage that was built after Kristen disappeared with the concrete bottom. And they weren't able to search under these planters that were on the property planters that would yield no growth 
Nothing would grow on these planters because below a little bit of the earth was more concrete. The property of Ruben Flores was never searched, even though he had a lot of land that would be very easy to hide a body if necessary. And people in that podcast I listened to that knew him were very surprised to hear that because of the type of person Ruben was. Apparently he wasn't a very nice man, allegedly. And according to his ex, allegedly he was, he had a bad temper and he just was kind of a scary dude, but they never searched his property. At least they didn't search it then. I think they're probably searching it right now <laughs> as we speak because what police had was only circumstantial and they did not believe that they had enough to warrant an arrest. The deputy at the time, which I believe was a man named Deputy Williams, or it might have been Sheriff Williams, he made a statement to the press. And this is that statement. The fact of the matter is we have very qualified detectives who have conducted well over a hundred interviews and everything leads back to Mr. Flores there are no other suspects. So absent something from Mr. Flores, I don't see us completing this case. In response to this, Paul zipped those lips. He was like, oh, if I don't say anything, they can't do anything. Paul ended up invoking his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination during a grand jury hearing and also a deposition that was conducted by the Smarts family attorney. He literally would say nothing to every single question they asked. He just repeated the same thing that he was invoking his Fifth Amendment right. And his attorney was a huge dick about it too. There was even a deal on the table where if he pled guilty to involuntary manslaughter, told police what happened and led them to her body, he would only get six years, six years but this deal was never made. Between the years of 1996, when she disappeared in 2007, there were several searches for her, for either information on her, items belonging to her, or her body, her dead or alive, but most people did believe that at this point she was dead. No useful leads were ever found, and Paul Flores, for all this time, was police's number one suspect. Kristen Smart was declared dead on May 25th, 2002, the sixth year anniversary of her disappearance. The most generally believed theory in this case is that Paul Flores, instead of taking Kristen back to her own room where her roommate was waiting, took her back to his room instead where his roommate was away and he had the room to himself. I, it's not thought that it was premeditated. It's thought that he had been at this party. He had run into these people with this incapacitated girl. He had asked the other girl for a kiss and been rejected, and then was then left alone with this tall, beautiful, completely incapacitated woman who could do nothing to defend herself. And he was like, hmm, I'm gonna take advantage of this, like the stupid human piece of trash that I am. It's thought that he then either attempted to or completed raping her. And at some point she, came to enough to fight back, which would have explained the black eye and the scratches on his arm. It's thought that maybe he even put her in a chokehold to incapacitate her because I believe the scratches were like on the outside of his forearm. It's thought that he either accidentally or purposely killed her by choking her or that she perhaps had been laying on her back after the attack and had asphyxiated on her own vomit because at one point he went to take a shower and left her alone or so he says. Not that he said that he left her alone while he took a shower. He told police that he took a shower that night and he was seen in the communal shower. So it's thought that if this scenario did happen that she could have choked while he was away. Either way, at this point, she is dead. And he then is like, well, I gotta get rid of this body. So he wraps her in a blanket and then transports her to his truck where he goes to dispose of her, maybe with his parents' help. There is also a theory that instead of taking her in his vehicle to try to you know, dispose of her, he instead put her in the campus dumpsters that then the next morning were taken away and put into a landfill, but that landfill has been heavily searched. And based on the arrests that have been made, the things that have been confiscated, the charges against the men, I believe the former is more likely. I've also seen it theorized that perhaps he had actually drugged her at that party, given her roofies, and then waited for her to pass out. And that's why he was able to just swoop in and grab her. I'm not sure if I believe that one because from the way her her actions were described. It does sound like a drunk girl to me, but again, we'll find out more later. But either way, I believe what I think probably happened is that he was taking her to her room. He got her alone. He pivoted, went to his room. He raped her. As far as if he killed her or if she choked, I'm really honestly not sure. I feel like he probably killed her because if she had just choked, he could have even said that it was consensual. You know what I mean? Like there's no proof 
there's no way to really prove that it had been raped. So he could have said that they consensually had sex and then he went to the shower and came back and that she was gone. But we'll find out more as the case progresses. As I said before, Kristen Smart's parents filed a wrongful death suit against Paul Flores. And the last that I saw on it is that it hadn't come to fruition at all, that the police were not giving the family the evidence that they would need in order to go through with this hearing. And Paul has continuously said he has nothing to do with it. And his family actually ended up suing Kristen's family for emotional distress. Apparently there's a man named Dennis who, I don't know if he works for the family and I don't believe he even has any relation to the family and he's not an actual private investigator, but he's been working the case, trying to find as much information as he can since 1997. Apparently he even went as far as getting a job at a pizza place near the campus so that he could ask students what they knew about Kristen Smart. Well, apparently in addition to this, he was following the Flores as everywhere, Paul, his parents, other family members. Anyway, apparently it got so bad that the Flores has actually filed a restraining order against this man. And because it's believed that this guy was like hired by the smarts, that was one of the things that they used in their lawsuit against the smarts. In September of 2016, just 20 years after Kristen's disappearance, police announced that they had a new lead they were going to investigate. Cadaver dogs from the FBI and investigators were brought in and they spent three days excavating a portion of land, these hills, on the Cal Poly campus. And apparently they did find something. Items were found at three different dig sites in a hillside near Kristen's old dorm room. And I did hear that these items were also referred to as remains, but I feel like if that had been true by now, we would have known that was in 2016. At the time, the police said that the items that were found needed to be looked into to see if they had anything to do with Kristen's case and that it could take days, weeks, months. It's been years. We've heard nothing. And as of 2020, there was still nothing released about what was found there. Things are going to start moving a little quicker now, as far as like timeline. In January of 2020, police confirmed that two trucks that had been belonging, that had been belonging to Paul Flores had been taken in as evidence. In February of 2020, search warrants were served at four different locations, two in San Luis Obispo, which is where the school was located, one in Washington state, which I found to be interesting and I couldn't figure out why that would be. And one in Los Angeles, California, which I believe Paul Flores was living in, in San Pedro, which is in Los Angeles County. During these searches, Paul Flores was detained so that they could do the searches. In April of 2020, a search warrant was served to Paul Flores to search his San Pedro home, which again was in Los Angeles County. And while there, they took several items of interest. Okay. And of these items were computer towers, cell phones, and some very old electronics. In March of 2021, a search warrant was served on Ruben Flores's house. Paul's father, the one that they hadn't searched before. And they brought in cadaver dogs and ground penetrating radar. And the dogs hit on an old Volkswagen, which was then taken in as evidence. And then on April 13th, 2021, so just a week ago now, Paul Flores and his father, Ruben Flores, were arrested and taken into custody under the suspicion of Kristen Smart's disappearance. Paul, who is 44, was charged with murder and is being held without bail. And Ruben, who is 80, was charged as being an accessory to murder. And his bail was set for $250,000. Police were at the home of Ruben Flores on April 14th. So just like just a second ago, and they were dismantling a deck in the backyard and searching the grounds. As of now, they have not found a body, but they believe they are closer than ever to actually uncovering her remains. A county sheriff for San Luis Obispo actually gave credit to the podcast, Your Own Backyard by Chris Lambert for bringing new information to the investigation, new leads, new witnesses, things they had never even looked into. From interviewing these new witnesses, they were able to get additional information that led them to being able to get the search warrant they needed. Chris Lambert, the host of the podcast, the man who did all the footwork for the podcast said of the arrest, and I quote, the podcast was one part of a whole formula. Even with what I found, I can't go arrest somebody. I need the sheriff's office to do their job. I was willing to do what I could to assist in that. You can get varying levels of agreement on whether what I did directly led to an arrest. My personal opinion was that I was one piece of the formula, which is very modest. And I think that that's like a great statement. The host of the podcast, Chris Lambert was only 
eight years old when Kristen went missing and he didn't even know her, but as he got older and he was driving around, he would always see the billboard with her face plastered on it and the reward. And it always reminded him that she was still missing. So he was like, you know what? I'm going to see what I can do about this. This is right near my home. I find myself for whatever reason, very interested and I want to be invested in this. So he went out, he got some of recording equipment, he got over his shyness and he just went out and started talking to people. And this was the outcome. The sheriff also did give himself a little bit of credit here and he said since taking office in 2011, his crew has served more than 41 different search warrants on the smart case, conducted physical searches in 16 different locations, submitted 37 items of early evidence for DNA testing, recovered 193 pieces of new physical evidence, conducted 137 new personal interviews, and completed 500 additional police reports independent of the podcast. They wanted you to know they're doing stuff too, okay? Of the arrest of Paul and Ruben Flores, the Smart family says it's a bittersweet feeling and they released a statement that said, and I quote, for over 24 years, we have waited for this bittersweet day. It is impossible to put into words what this day means for our family. We pray it is the first step to bringing our daughter home. According to a statement released by California prosecutors, they believe that Paul Flores took Kristen back to his dorm room, attempted to rape her and killed her in the process. Specifically, DA Dan Doe said of it, and I quote, it is alleged he caused Kristen's death while in the commission of or attempt to commit rape. He also said that it is believed that Ruben Flores, Paul's father, helped conceal Kristen's body after the murder was committed. He also said, Significant new information has come into the sheriff's department over the last two years and some very important information just a month ago. What is this important information? I need to know right now. I'm a nosy ass bitch, 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 bitch. When Paul was arrested, his defense attorney said, and I quote, I disagree with the district attorney. I don't believe there is any evidence, specifically objective physical evidence that shows that my client committed a crime. I don't think they have sufficient evidence to prove my client did anything wrong. The complaint against Paul says that the prosecution intends to admit evidence of prior sexual acts. They essentially are saying that they believe that during his years as a free man and his years at Cal Poly, Paul may have committed other sexual crimes. They're asking for anyone with information on Kristen's case and also any other crimes that Paul may have committed to contact authorities. And I find that very interesting. I'm kind of curious as to what they know or if they just suspect something. So that should be interesting to see come out. And it's weird because I did look into what they have on him so far. And it seems like since being, you know, since Kristen's disappearance, he hasn't committed any other violent crimes that, that we are aware of, but he has gotten several DUIs. This is like an ongoing problem throughout his life. The arraignment was set to take place for both Paul and his father, Ruben, on April 15th, 2021. Both men appeared by Zoom call. Paul was in a suit and his father in an orange jumpsuit. Both of their attorneys asked for a continuance to Monday, April 19th, 2021. And at that time, they will both um, enter their pleas and they will also hear arguments about the men's bails. The judge approved this request. So the hearings on their arraignments are today. The day that you're watching is the day that you are watching this is the day that they're going to enter their pleas. So if that's happening when you're watching this, leave it in the comments. Let's talk. The judge also granted the defense's request for a protective order for these men because of the high profile nature of the case. The Smart family said of the delay, and I quote, After nearly 25 years of waiting, today's delay in the arraignment process was not unexpected or surprising. Make no mistake, we have begun the final quest to bring justice for Kristen. We know we are in good hands with the San Luis Obispo County District Attorney's Office, and we will wait patiently for the process to commence. And that, my friends, is the story of the disappearance of Kristen Smart. What do you think? It's freaking wild, right? I cannot believe that after all this time, they finally got an arrest and because of the help of a podcast, that's amazing. Podcasters, man, good podcasters are heroes. You don't often hear about anyone going so hard, like any podcaster going so hard in one case like this and putting all their time into it and look at what can happen. It's just like with the serial podcast, because of that podcast, we know how the court process was against Adnan Saeed. And as for Paul Flores, it, feels so obvious. It seems so obvious that he was so guilty, like even from the start. It's crazy to me that it took this long to get here because it just seems like everyone knew and there was so much evidence pointing to him. 
Like, I don't know why they didn't interview these people or look into him further, interview people that knew him. I know that there's like a process and there's a lot of red tape, but this took 24 years and that is 24 years too long. And that's the that on that. I'm going to be keeping an eye on updates on this case. I'm really, really anxious to see the arraignment on Monday. I mean, well, Monday for me, today for you. So let's talk about that down below. I'm very curious to see how they'll plead because I don't know why they would need a continuance if it was just going to be not guilty. You know what I mean? So I'm very curious to see what happens today, Monday. Obviously, I want Paul and his father to get the maximum sentence possible. And I hope that they're able to find Kristen's body without the help of these men, because if they can't find the body, and a lot of times these will not tell where a body is without some sort of deal, I wonder if a plea deal will be made in order for the family to be able to bring her home. So there's just like, there's so much coming and it's like, oh, what is going to happen? There's just a lot. There's a lot happening. Everything's in the air, just balls flying through the air. And I'm excited to see how it progresses. I really, really hope that they get the max and they're able to get the body. That's the best case scenario. I mean, the best case scenario would have been her coming alive, coming home alive. But I just, I don't think that's the case here. I don't think anybody does, unfortunately. And I just want her family to get some peace. And I want these assholes to go to jail because I believe that they're guilty. I believe for sure that Paul's guilty. Like I, the first time I heard about this case, I was like, oh, that guy, right? That guy, are we going to arrest him? Because he fucking did it. <laughs> But I will have to do an update video soon because there are a couple of cases that I've covered recently where like the the end result was in the air. So I'm going to have to do an update video for you guys soon so that we can sit down and talk about where all of these cases have landed. So look forward to that. I don't know when, but I will. Maybe a live stream. I don't know. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope that it was interesting and informative and gave you all the information you would want thus far in the Kristen Smart case. Of course, I hope you enjoyed watching it because I want you to enjoy what I'm putting out into the world in some dark way. I just, you know, I, you know what I'm saying. And of course, thank you for hanging out and remembering Kristen with me today. What happened to her is so tragic and it just must be so incredibly difficult for her parents to know, like they know what happened. They know who did it and to have to sit there and have nothing done for this long is absolutely horrible. So I hope that they get their justice soon. Please, of course, let me know of any cases you'd like to see me cover down below. I have a long, long list of cases, but every time you add one, I add it to the list and I put your name next to it to give you a shout out because I want to look into what you're suggesting because you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise, you would not be here. Of course, make sure to join the Brad Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell because I put out a new morbid makeup video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you cutie patootie. And if you want to follow me more consistently, Instagram and Twitter is where I'm most active. They're both Bradderstein. You often get polls and case spoilers on uh, Instagram. That's where I'm most active. And if you want to join my Facebook group or follow my Facebook page, the page is Bradderstein and the group is Morbid Makeup True Crime. And with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That's tight. You're tight. Please be better than you were yesterday. At the very least, be a better person than Paul Flores. And I hope to see you in my next video.